welcome everyone. And today we're going to talk about government gazettes. They're an underutilized resource that everyone should really be looking at because they are full of names. And even if by some minute chance you did not find one of your ancestral names there, you will find the context in which your ancestors lived. Now, there are three types of government gazettes. You have the standard government gazette, the police gazette, and the education gazette. Today, I'm only going to talk about the government gazette and police gazette, the education gazette. I just couldn't fit into the presentation. But if you want to find out about teachers and schools and what's happening in that, you need to go and have a look at the education gazette too. So government gazettes are the voice of the government. This is how the government is talking to other government departments. It's how it's putting laws and regulations out to the general public. And it's how it's actually then reporting back on various things that such as registrations and items that they need the public to know. Government appointments, promotions in the civil service, demotions sometimes, and all sorts of bits and pieces. And it does change a little bit over time about what's being required. Now, the first one was published in 1841, and it was actually it was published by the uh, colonial secretary, and it was actually published in the newspapers. Now, that lasted for about four or five years, and then you had a gap for a little bit, and then we started coming in again, because you did have provincial gazettes for the North and South Island. And um, in 1857, it's renamed the New Zealand Gazette, and then published weekly from there. In 2014, it no longer was published on paper and started being published online. And then in October 2017, it stopped being a weekly publication and the notices were published online as required. So on, on business days. So what are you going to find in it? Well, you're going to find land transfers. Lots and lots and lots of them. Now, these tend to be uh, crown lands that are being put out. Land grants. Now, the law changed in 1858 relating to land. So when you look at this one, you're seeing land grants that were granted in the 1840s that are being republished in the Gazette because it relates to the law as it changed in 1858. So this is an 1860 Gazette. So just be a little open in some of your time frames, particularly around the early time frames. Yep, the Native Land Court Act as well. You're going to see a whole range of items from that being mentioned in it as well. Appointments to the post office. Because you know, that's really, really important. If you've got someone who's actually working in the post office, you can follow their career through um, when they got paid a bit extra, which um, post office they were being in and what their official title was for that. Were they just starting out? Were they a telephone exchange person? Were they the postmaster? You can follow them through. You can find deceased estates that the public trustee managed, and it will tell you that. Um, and of course, Quested, as you know, is the name surname I research. So James Robert Quested um, was from Nightcaps. Um, his colonial um, non-residence was England. And um, 10th of December 1901 was when the public trustee took over the management of his estate. He died on the 1st of October, 1901. Now they know who his relatives are when they're handling the estate. There are a number there where they don't know the relatives, and but they give a little bit of info that um, someone was a trooper in the New Zealand contingent. In a bit, they're gonna be trying to find relatives so they can actually go through further. I don't know what the closure period for your public trustee estates are, but of course, wills, we always wanna go and looking at them. And even if they've died intestate, there's still the handling of the will that the public trustee has done. Doctor nurse registrations. Now, this is the registered number, but what's even more important is you can continue going through and actually find out when the doctor and where they qualified. Now, Dr. Cameron here, Malcolm Cameron, now he got his initial qualification in 1881 in Canada. He then became a licensed of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. He also became um, a licensed the Royal College in um, a second one in Edinburgh. It's a different second in, of surgery in Edinburgh. So you can actually see their qualifications. Now the nurses are listed 
by their registration number. But if they've gone through and they've done an extra qualification such as midwifery, you're going to then see that they're listed as being registered as midwives and where they got their midwife's qualification. That leads you to some further research you can do back into those qualifications about where they've been. This is the postal district of Invercargill. So we're going through here and for the Edendale district, the, um, the number of times they have to do it under the mail contract is as required. So apparently there wasn't too much mail going in that area, but there's other places where they've got to deliver twice weekly. There's some places like Kingston where they in Queenstown, they've got to deliver daily. And it tells you who got the contract and it tells you how they are expected to be doing the delivery. Are they doing it by coach, by horse, by cart? Do they have to deliver on foot? Um, do they have to deliver by boat? Now, maybe it's not your ancestor who's the contractor, but maybe you've got ancestors living in that district in this particular time frame, and you, when you're writing up the story, know that they are supposed to get their mail delivered once a week, twice a week, daily. That can be just a little snippet you can add into your family history that you've picked up from the Government Gazette. Now, of course, this can change over time frame. So have a look to see what the next contract can contract came out as to what happens as to maybe it's changed maybe the population has increased and maybe they've got twice weekly deliveries now causes of death as you know I was a public health microbiologist so things like that are quite important you do get a number of those listed over the time frames where things have changed because governments are interested in the numbers of people. Now you're not gonna find your ancestor listed as dying of a diarrheal disease or whatever, but knowing what was around at the time, again, can give you information for your families, for context. Was your ancestor in business? Did their business dissolve either through bankruptcy or maybe they bought out their partner? So this is a business where it's dissolved and the partnership is no longer going to be the thing. And it tells you who's taking over the business, who's going to be responsible for the debts. Licensing. Oh, there are so many government licenses. You think you have things that you have to register for today for the government? Your ancestors did too. So, so many of them. But the thing with licensing is you also have committees who are appointed. So maybe your ancestor didn't just have to pay whatever the license was. Maybe they were on the committee overseeing it. So you can actually get a bit of a feel for that. If you had farmers in New Zealand, sadly, sheep scab came in and it was an infectious disease, which was from a parasite, which I'm not going to try and pronounce. Um, but it was a really, really big issue from the 1840s to the 1890s. And you had lots of legislation because this particular parasite affected the wool. And that was a massive crop for New Zealand. You couldn't afford to have something that was going to affect the wool. And it, it decreased the quality of the wool, but it also affected the health of the sheep. So you really were doing your best to eradicate it. And one of the ways they are actually doing that, there was a legal a requirement to notify if you had infected sheep on your property, and that was printed in the Gazette. So that's a huge impost on a farmer if suddenly he's got sheep that, or she, let's not be sexist here, has sheep that are effect, infected because they're not going to be able to sell them. They're going to have to do extra requirements. They're not going to be able to transport them off the farm. There's a whole heap of requirements around it. Again, you can look in the Gazette to see what the legislation was about what the requirements are. Again, it gives context to your family. Patents. You can have an inventor in the family. Now, I'm not saying all inventors are successful, but some of them certainly were, but there were lots of enthusiastic people who did inventions. So you can actually look, these are the applications for the patent get listed here. So then remembering frequently the gazettes are a stepping stone for you to do external research. So we can go from here. So we have a, a patent application for the invention for pressing wool, hay, or other products of the same nature to be called the compound lever rack wool press. Now, the patent number is in the bottom left-hand corner, number 1273. So we can go to the patent office and put in 
patent number 1273. It will tell us that that patent was done in 1900 and it is now expired because patents only last for a certain time frame and the length of time that patent lasts will vary over time. But we can also scroll further down the page and we can download the PDF of the patent. This is the engineering drawing of the wool press and you can see your ancestor's signature because they're the ones, or if they were the inventor, who put it through. Um, and that's a four page patent. Now, you can also search by inventor. Now, Hen Henry Corrick was pretty good. He's got 13 patents listed and you can get the PDFs of all of those if they are out of patent protection. If they're still in patent protection, it's a little bit more regulated. You can still know that they've put a patent in, but you don't get quite as much detail that you can download. But they're lovely things to have to add to your family history. Even if the patent really never went in, even they never sold anything, it is still something you can add. Registrations are friendly societies and charities. Now, if your ancestor was a member of a certain friendly society, and realistically, most males um, in the working classes and professional classes did become members of one or another type of friendly society. Now, all of those had to be registered. So when, when did your particular friendly society start? You can see the registration of them, and there's reports that have to be put in every year about them. It's the number of members they've got and that sort of thing. And you can find this sort of information in the Gazette. Gold leases. You went through a whole time frame where gold was ever imp important. So you had gold leases being given, you had gold leases being taken away, you had gold leases that were ongoing, you had companies involved in gold leases because you also had a situation where it was a requirement for companies every year to do a statement of company affairs. Now, because these are ones who are basically selling shares and putting out shares. So the government wants to know, well, okay, what are the assets for the company? How many shares there are? How many shares have been traded and that sort of thing. And what the requirements for them to actually do the statement on each year does change over a time frame. But again, you can get a bit of information about that. Now, a lot of these companies just don't survive. They may have only been around for a couple of years and things just didn't go right. Um, and then suddenly you can perhaps find a bankruptcy notice, but you'll find all of those in there as well. Cemeteries have to have trustees. And so these, the appointees for the trustees get listed. And when the trustees resign, they get listed too. And again, that can give you some information in your local area. So, so many are boards, harbour boards, rabbit boards, possum boards, all of the things that come through for your local area where they've got a group of people who are trying to get according to the legislation. People get appointed to the board, people resign from the board, you're going to find those sorts of things listed in the Government Gazette. Now, these are government style bodies. This is not necessarily going to be your local dairy company, which is a, a cooperative with that sort of thing. So there are things that will be there. There are things that won't. Now, you have also things like who's going to be the registrar for birth, deaths and marriages for a district. This is John Wagstaff Brain. And he's also He's the registrar for marriages as well, and also to be the vaccination inspector for the district of, and yes, I'm not going to actually try and pronounce it because you'll only laugh at me. I apologize in advance. But we can actually go looking for what else John Wagstaff Brain did. So he's not only the registrar for birth, deaths and marriage, he's also a postmaster. And he's a fourth grade postmaster. So when he starts off, he gets 150 pounds a year. And then in 1893, he gets an upgrade. He gets 175 pounds a year. And then 1894, he's still on 175 pounds. And it also tells you he's still the registrar all the way through. He was first appointed to the government um, in, on the 1st of July, 1874, and length of service as the 31st of March, 1894, was 19 years, nine months and zero days. And 1894 is the last mention. So I suspect that he racked up his 20 years and retired with a pension, hopefully from the postal department. 
and the registrar and whatever else they'd managed to get him to do in his local area. Because what you can see looking through the Gazette is frequently a number of these positions, they're not full time positions. So they can sometimes get one person and they just load extra on him. And we'll see that coming through with some of our police constables. Militia, appointments, promotions, demotions, sometimes resignations. So you can get to see some of that stuff happening. Militia commissions that get cancelled will be there. Now, if they're officers, you've got a good chance of picking them up. If they're non-officers, yeah, I'm sorry. They didn't care about any of our lot. Um, so you're not going to see them in the Gazette. You might see that in your local paper. So remember, look at these things in conjunction. So the education exam for the civil service in 1893, the period of literature will be the reign of Elizabeth and the special books will be Shakespeare's Hamlet and Macaulay's essays on Bacon and Walpole. So if you're sitting the civil service exam, this is going to be your English style component. I'm glad I didn't have to set it. Crown land notices and the changes. Land for sale. Land that's being taken back. We're going to put a road through. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So the government puts a notice in stating which land they're taking back. Mining notices of a whole range of different companies and relations. And then you can actually follow these through with some of your company notices. Now, Ancestry has got a really good range for the New Zealand Gazette. Well, not quite so good. So, um, but what they do have as well is some subsections where other people have extracted notices from the Gazette and put them out. And, you know, they used to be able to buy the CDs of them. In fact, you probably still can buy the CDs of them. Um, so Ancestry's got a number of those sub-collections. So it's worth looking at some of those. But remembering, of course, the Auckland Library has the New Zealand government gazettes from the start, including the provincial gazettes, which you can access as PDFs at the library, as does Christchurch Library and ask at your other local library because it is a commercial publication. Police gazettes. Now, some of you are thinking, no, my people weren't criminals, so they're not going to be in the police gazette. But remember, the police gazettes are not just criminals. There are policemen in there. There are clerks of courts in there. There are the poor victims in there. There are the witnesses to crime. And I will show you why you really, really, really want to look in the police gazettes. So um, you had provincial police gazettes prior to 1877, such as the Otago Gazette from 1861, which you can find on Papers Past. And then the first national New Zealand Police Gazette was the 2nd of July, 1877, published fortnightly. And from June 1904, it's published weekly. So this is an example of the Otago Gazette on Papers Past. Um, and you can just sort of have a bit of a look-see um, and you can pick that up. Now, very nicely, from 1886, the New Zealand Police did mud chocks. Now, they actually started publishing them in the Gazette from the 20th of April, 1904. Now, these are just not mugshots of murderers and really severe crimes. These are mugshots of people who are up there for drunk and disorderly. Don't know about you, but I have a number of people in my family, in my past, who have been up for drunk and disorderly. I will admit some of them were up for obscene language, causing a disturbance in the street on a Friday night, etc. Now, you can actually get mugshots of a number of those. That may be the only photo you have of that ancestor. So think about mugshots. Now, um, you may want to see that perhaps it's not quite as mugshotty as this one. This is John Mackenzie, who was the first mugshot that was published in the Gazette, and he was wanted for murder. So, and from 1908, they also, they did, they put in pictures of discharged prisoners if they hadn't already had a photo previously. So certainly we do our straight on shot and we do a sideways shot. Um, now the straight on shot's quite reasonable. No one's going to actually know it's a mug shot, just like some of your militia enlistments in your World War I and World War II photos, aren't they? So one of these is Albert Edward Double. Now in 1894, he had last knee for three months discharge. He was tried again in Auckland. 
And this is when they took the photo that went into the Gazette, discharged again, got back into strife again in 1914, indecency and drunkenness. Now, he was convicted and discharged. He didn't serve time for that one. Obscene language in 1917, got a fine. Obscene language again in 1919, got three months. 1930, he's intoxicated in charge of a vehicle, fined five pounds and lost his license. Doesn't seem to appear again after that. This is Thomas Patrick Cuttle. Now, he has 32 mentions in the Police Gazette between 1905 and 1941. Now, the picture there is quite reasonable. No one's going to know necessarily it's from the Police Gazette. But, you know, his crimes were really major, major crimes. He didn't kill anyone or did any major, major assaults. And the 1941, he got six months for being a rogue and a vagabond. And I didn't get around to looking at the paper because... You have to go and find out a bit more about what that meant because it said he was imposing on a private individual. So I'd say he was possibly camped out in someone's garden. Someone made a complaint. One of the things you're also going to see is return of prisoners discharge. Now that sounds quite, but it has a huge amount of information. It tells you the jail they came out of, tells you the name of the prisoner and any alias they may be using. And some of them used lots of aliases. It tells you where they were tried, which means you can go back and look in the um, papers for the court reports. It tells you what the offence was, which is always nice to know what the sentence was, where they are a native of. Now, certainly it might be New Zealand, but in the early days, most of them weren't. Um, what their occupation or trade was, the year they were born, their height, their complexion, their hair, their eyes, the nose. Because remember, prior to photographs coming through, the, these descriptions were how people identified people. Once they started doing photography, when they did a photo of them, now, if they already had a photo of them, they didn't do a second one generally, unless a few years had gone by, and remarks and previous convictions. So this is what it looks like. So you can see here that um, William Gray um, was um, charged in Christchurch. Um, in 1915, he went up for theft, a fine or seven days. So we're not talking serious crime here. He's a labourer, um, born in 1872, five foot seven and a half, fresh complexion, light brown hair, grey eyes, medium nose. I'd be really nice to see a photo that told me what a medium nose, a large nose was, and a, a short nose. What's a short nose, people? Then it tells you where they when they were discharged, and then it gives you some other remarks and situations you know so the last gentleman edward diggs is a half caste negro um that was photographed at littleton and it was photographed in 1907 this is a 1915 police gazette so it means you can go back to 1907 um because it and it tells you in 1912 he also had another conviction so this fellow's been up three times in that space of those what 1908 years so the remarks can actually be quite interesting as well because it talks about scars, tattoos, all of those sorts of things. And the range of tattoos are quite cool. You know, he's a sailor. He was he has a sailor tattoo, a heart on the right arm, lesse and CC, which I'm not quite sure about, on the left arm. See the police gazette, two upper front teeth out, um, upper front teeth out, left forefinger stiff, stout build, small mouth. Handed to authorities. Not sure why that one was in the remarks. Um, but I found sort of one interesting there. A brandy nose and he's a noted wrestler. Now, I suspect that was in the remarks column for the police themselves to know this is a fellow to be a little bit wary of and perhaps put a couple of extra constables on when you're dealing with him. So the remarks can be quite interesting. You can get the range of tattoos and then you get now, repeatedly convicted. I can almost hear the sigh of disappointment when they're writing that in. Now, of course, we had a lot of movement backwards and forwards. So the colonial states in Australia would send information across to New Zealand, same as New Zealand would send information to the various police gazettes there. And prior to 1901, um, remember, we were individual colonies there, but each state is still responsible for its policing. So we still have our police gazettes per each state. So if, if they suspected they were going across to Victoria, the New Zealand police would send it across to the Victorian Gazette, who may CC it to the New South Wales Gazette, Tasmanian Gazette, South Australia, Queensland Gazette. 
So this is from the Victorian Police Gazette back to New Zealand because they suspect there's going to be some linkage. Um, so, and of course, this one is a quite reasonable because they actually um, had gold being stolen on a ship coming backwards and forwards. So quite logical. So this is giving some information about arrest warrants that are being sought for various people. And it's frequent to actually have here something along the lines of um, uh, reported to be stolen by John Smith and then suspected fictitious name next to it. So you can see a whole range of things. I always find it quite interesting that they give you the description of the clothing they were wearing at the time as if they only ever had one suit of clothes. Um, now, some people may have, so, but I always find it quite interesting, particularly when they repeat it for about a year sitting in the Gazette and it's still the same set of clothes that they were first seen wearing wherever. Listings of items stolen. So maybe your person was the person who had something stolen from their house. Maybe when they were on the train um, in a hotel, maybe they had horse stock or something stolen from their farm. So you get a whole range of it. So a double-barreled hammerless gun, 12 ball, William Powell and son, 13 cars lane, Birmingham on the stock, which is more bent than in most guns. Hmm, I'm not sure I'd be using a gun that was more bent than in most guns, but Miss Sarah Jane Whitten reported stolen from a bedroom at the club hotel, a lady's massive gold medallion. Now, maybe that never got back, but if that was your person, you knew that at that point when she reported it stolen, she had a massive gold medallion. And this one, a, a hunting watch presented to him on the inside case and a gold bowl book with long links. Now, one of the things with the Police Gazette that's on Ancestry is it's a working copy and you'll often see handwritten annotations. So on this one, we can go to page 60 and in the Police Gazette, they start numbering it the page one for the year and then it goes through to the end of the year. So you go hunting for page 60 for that to see what happened and they found it. So this gives a whole range of information. Now, I find this quite interesting. It's 1927, this gentleman's a plumber, William Thomas Hall. And when they stole stuff from his house, boy, did they get a whole range of really nice jewelry out. Um, this is in 1927, and the total value of the jewelry is listed as being 52 pound. So that's pretty decent. Now we know plumbers have got a reputation now for earning lots of money. I didn't was in 1927 but but it also tells you that there was a portion of the jewelry recovered so again more items for research maybe some of that jewelry was recovered and maybe William Thomas Hall's in your family and maybe in a will one of those items of jewelry gets mentioned now you've got some more story behind it and I loved this one James Webberley is a hairdresser report stolen on the 27th, a clumber spaniel, light brown with whitish hair on breast. Um, he can do tricks and he answers to Barney. So is it your ancestor? Did you know they had a dog? And did you know the dog was called Barney and that it did tricks? And they did get it back, which is cool. But one of the really, really lovely sections is the missing friend section. Police, of course, were the ones where someone, if they couldn't find someone, would send a letter to the police saying, my uncle, aunt, brother, whatever, went to New Zealand in such and such a time and we haven't heard from him and we're concerned about him. Can you tell us what happened to him? And you get also, but other government departments also talk to the police. So we have Thomas Hanman, who was formerly an inmate at the Burnham Industrial School and the education department's hunting for him. Um, he was 17. And he apparently left when he shouldn't have been leaving um, at that stage. Now, this was article was republished in 1897 from an 1896 Police Gazette. And then a little bit later in the piece, we suddenly find that, um, yeah, well, we found him. And um, he's actually serving 12 months in jail. And technically, we probably should have known that he was serving time in jail. So they went hunting for him and found him in their own jail. So they found him. William Quinn's inquired for by his brother, John Quinn, who is a chief steward of the um, SS Wyanui through the Greymouth Police. He's a native of County Clare Island, a minor, 50 years of age, 5 foot 10, high, stout build, sandy complexion, blue eyes, full beard, whiskers and moustache. He was last heard of at Dunedin in 1887 
and may now be on one of the Otago gold fields. That is genealogical gold. Apart from anything else, you know about the brother and what the brother's doing at this time. So we really want to be looking at these. Information about John Price, where he's a native of. So you know he's a seaman. It tells you all about him. Now, this is in 1881, this missing persons request. It tells you he left Newport on the 5th of August, 1861, by the ship Silver Cloud, and then was last heard of Greymouth in February, 1871. And it's his mother, and you've got her address in Wales. <coughs> Whereabouts of Benjamin Evans? This gives a whole range of information. Again, this is 1881. This tells you when he left in, what he was doing in 1858 when he left. And then what happens in 1864, where he reckons he purchased some land and that um, the deeds were in the registrar's office and he was last heard of in 1866 when he might return to Sydney. Now, I'm not quite sure who William Hancock and why the butler of Picton Castle is actually doing the requesting, but presumably he's some sort of relative. Maybe it's the brother-in-law. Who knows? More research can be done. They're still going missing in 1927. Now, so we, we know that Arthur Gibbs um, went missing. He was a native of England. It tells you about him. And the city treasury office on behalf of Gibbs' father in England. And then it, you've got some previous gazettes to go looking for in 1926. And they found the police found him on the 24th of the 8th, 27. Now, you don't know what happened when they found him, but you know that they did find him. 1944, we're still getting reports about people missing. And this one, they do actually tell you that they found him in 1945 and he was deceased. And that's page 96 in the 1945 Police Gazette. We'll have something about that. Charles Henry Ingall was missing. Um, now, he was up on charges because he hadn't maintained his wife and child. And they found him and sadly he was deceased. He was found drowned. Thomas Govins. Now the police send out reports and missing queries as well, where they're looking for the police in other jurisdictions to do investigations can be listed. And it gives you a bit of history as well. Now he's been gone missing and he hasn't contributed to the support of three illegitimate children by Mary Herring. Now, when you're looking for some of these, because there's quite a lot of these style reports where the father is being chased because he's not supporting the wife and child, the mistress and child, mistress and children in this case. Um, but you won't see the names of the children. You'll see the name of the wife or girlfriend. So if you've got an, uh, a child who doesn't have a father and you're thinking of possibly the mother might have chased him for maintenance, don't search under the name of the child. Search for the mother. At failing to apprehend to provide for the maintenance of his illegitimate children by Elizabeth Miller since 1896. Now, this was in 1897. Tells you a bit about him. Um, Thomas McCarthy, same thing. Illegitimate child by Mabel Orange. Now, he was arrested and then remanded. Now, some of these are have a lot of money they owe um, for their illegitimate children. Um, so William Henry Copeland's up on the same charge. John, Fergus John Adams is up on the charge and these two have been arrested. Now, part of the problem is sometimes these ones get arrested and then serve six months in jail, but do they pay the back arrears to the wife? Probably not because they've served their time in jail. So again, it's not a perfect system. Um, this one was 53 pound in arrears on the maintenance order, um, but it does give you a reasonable amount of information. He also should have been going into Auckland prison for two months because he didn't pay for the support of his illegitimate child by another person. He's doing pretty well, this fella. And just to show prove I'm not sexist, it's not just the disappearing fathers. So this one is a disappearing mother. She'd left her child in the care of this person. She was going to provide maintenance money for this nurse style thing to look after the child. And she didn't continue. And then a little bit later in the piece, you find that she has taken the child from it. And so that's the last we hear of it. Not just that, we've got another missing mother and she's being chased so she could be proceeded against for the support of her child because she's actually left it um, in the care of the government. But you've got a situation, she had been employed as a servant at the Bowling Green Hotel. Excuse me, so you get a bit of history. She'd nicked off with another male. Name unknown, which was unhelpful. We would have been nice to have known that for our own history. Inquests. 
Um, you can get a lot of detail in some of these, and sometimes you just get a couple of lines. Now, sometimes it's a case where they can work out a lot of history because they can identify the person. In a lot of instances, you're going to get situations there that a body's been found and it's too badly decomposed to be identified. And of course, when you look in the thing and you've got all those unknown, unknown males, they do belong to someone. And this one here, so they found the body of a man on the west bank of the river. They found, found drowned, gives a little bit of information. You probably will never know who this person is. Licensing laws. Now, some of these are cool because these are the license and spirit licenses that were cancelled. And some of the reasons why they were cancelled is quite interesting. So um, hopefully none of you are related to George Bruff because George Bruff's renewal for his um, wine and spirit license was refused on account of the fact that the applicant harboured thieves and prostitutes in his licensed house. Um, another one because of general bad management. Another one did not comply with the ordering of the licensing bench to put the house in stable into proper repair. So they put a reason for why they took the license away. There was a few others to the point that every time the licensing branch went there, the gentleman who had the license was drunk and totally intemperate in his habits. Obviously the person you want in charge of a pub. Deserters. We all talk about the fact that we have uh, people who have jumped ship. Yep, the police gazettes will have lists of them. Jumping ships from Her Majesty's ships or His Majesty's ships, depending on the year frame, and also from um, merchant ships, which is the next one. Now, this tells you that some of these are cancelled. Now, sometimes the government, because the reason the government puts it in is there's frequently a reward for it, and but sometimes they cancel it because they decide it's no longer necessary. And then this could well be your person who establishes it's a good, wonderful pioneer of the area. And it's not just Navy ships, it's also merchant vessels. Remember, seamen on merchant vessels sign a contract for generally a round trip voyage. And if they actually get off at not at their pro proper destination per their contract, that's a desertion. They've broken their contract. Absconding from industrial schools, you get a bit of information. And then, of course, there are the police. So we actually have lots of police promotions, resignations, information about their career, and you can follow them through. And of course, the good thing is police get given a police number. So if you've got a James Smith that you can work out was your James Smith and you have his police number, you can distinguish him from all the other James Smiths that were policemen. And we have the appointments because we have some of the constables who become clerks of the court. We have constables who become all sorts of different things, which we'll show you in a second. In previous years, if the police performed their duties particularly well, they got a reward bonus out of the reward bonus fund. Now, he got picked, he picked up three pound to a probationary detective. I don't know what the weekly wage was, but I reckon three pound as a bonus was probably going to be pretty nice. And this continued now in 1897, you're seeing a range of these. Eight pounds he got for a deserter. So in the space of just a few years, um, we went from three pound to eight pound. In 1944, you got the medals for long service being announced. Again, you see the police number coming through there. And of course, anyone who's worked in the government and administration, you know that there are always going to be the administration style reports in there. And so, Mr. Policeman, you are not supposed to be spending the government's money unnecessarily on extra words in telegrams. So do it as concisely worded as possible, please. So obviously someone was complaining about the amount of money that was being spent on telegrams. Police administration. This is telling you that when they're filling the vacancies for third class constables, they will give preference to anyone who's been in the militia. So that gives you some clues for those early police that there is a very strong probability you are going to find previous militia service when you go hunting for it because this adds context. And yeah, sometimes reading some of these administration and laws things is boring. I'll grant you that but it gives you the context of what was happening at the time for admission to various roles, 
and what the law meant at certain times. What was the requirement for getting Crown land at different times? What was the requirement for becoming a harbour master? What was the requirement for certain jobs in the government? Those requirements change over time. The Gazette is where you get that information. Miscellaneous. Um, members should not be giving credit. The clerks of the court should not be giving credit for court fees. So apparently there's been an awful lot of people not paying. So an extra administrative thing coming through. Was your ancestor a witness in court? This gives the daily payments to what a witness should be given in 1927. And you'll see these in the various years. If you don't see it in 1926, it may not have changed. So if you look for 1925. When there's a change, it will be reported in the Gazette. So you may have to go back through a few Gazettes. Um, sadly, this constable died on duty, so they were collecting money for him. Now, the police constables apparently weren't terribly busy in some areas because they end up being the registrar of electors. They end up being the inspector of weights and measures as well. So you get those appointments too. You'll get certain police that are being appointed as child welfare officers as well. And you'll see those listings in the police gazettes. Inspector of factories is another constable. So apparently you weren't having too much problem in those areas. So gazettes, they are the working documents of the government police force education department. It gives interactions with their staff within the department. It gives interaction with other government departments and it gives out the information they require the public to know. And it's full of names, huge lists of names, potentially your ancestors' names. Now, maybe your person isn't there. I would find it hard to believe, but maybe they're not. But you'll get the context of their lives and what's happening in the area from the Gazette. There's huge amounts of movement between New Zealand and the Australian colonies. And I believe we're talking about actually making it easier again. And we didn't even need a passport to go between till the 70s. Before that, we could just go backwards and forwards. And certainly in pioneer style time, there was no arguments whatsoever. And we nicked over there, you nicked over here. It just, we moved. So in the handout, I've given lists of Australian, where you can access Australian gazettes as well, because don't forget to go looking. Now, I'm not suggesting New Zealanders were criminals, but definitely look in the police gazettes because you're going to see the missing friends. Now, you may also find them in jail in various places or maybe being sought after for an illegitimate child they're not maintaining, but I'm not suggesting New Zealanders are criminals. But you really do need to look at gazettes. They are an underutilised genealogical treasure. Thank you.